So hi everyone, welcome. Uh, today the topic for us is object detection. So I guess until now you've looked at a lot of say classification use cases, but in this lecture we'll cover object detection. And I want to motivate it from say an autonomous driving uh, situation, right? So suppose you want to drive a car and then you need to say detect objects. So let's maybe try and motivate the problem. <laughs> Okay. So let's say we want to drive a car in uh, on Indian roads, and this is like a video that I took uh, in Hiranandani, right opposite IIT Bombay. So you see, I mean, if you if a vehicle needs to drive autonomously, it needs to detect other vehicles. It needs to know, okay, there are other vehicles in my uh, in my uh, route. Then it needs to say also detect pedestrians because then you need to behave differently. You need to detect maybe say police people and uh, obey their commands and so on, right? Now uh, this is fine, but then like the question is uh, so the thing is you know like existing roads are made for agents that can see in the visible spectrum so existing roads are made for humans and because we can see in the visible spectrum uh, we and since we want to reuse these roads we also need to enable uh, autonomous vehicle to see so what does the autonomous vehicle need to see the same things that a human sees and they are lane markings uh, traffic lights, traffic signs, intention and gesture of traffic policemen, construction workers. Uh, it also needs to then predict the path of pedestrians, uh, other nonverbal cues of uh, drivers, right? So computer vision is clearly the most important modality uh, for perception for an autonomous vehicle. And if you look at, say, the Tesla camera stack, you would see there are like a lot of vision-based cameras on this on the car. So there is like this rearward looking cameras, then there are wide forward cameras, then there are main forward cameras, and then there are narrow forward cameras. There is also a radar, just one radar, one forward facing radar. And this is what uh, Tesla uses for its autopilot, right? So this is what the Tesla camera stack looks like. Now let's try and uh, come up with some KPIs. So how I want to, uh, 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 structure this session is we will talk about what do we need to accomplish like what kind of object detection do we need to do uh, at what speed resolution and so on then we will uh, understand like the kpi so we'll come up with some basic uh, metrics that we need to achieve and then we'll un understand these metrics so we'll start from the boring part where we actually understand the metric essentially the mean average precision from there we will then go on to the algorithms, uh, various kinds of uh, um, improvements that have been happening on uh, this object detection algorithm, and finally end with some applications. And since we're doing it online, maybe I'll stop at say three, four, uh, uh, three, four points, and we can then sync at these places and stop maybe asking questions after every slide. So maybe once we've done metrics, we will stop. And if you maybe wait for like two slides before you ask your question, if uh, if it's really urgent and if you think I will not cover it later, right? So, uh, so hope that works with you. By the way, is my sound clear? Can everybody hear me well? Yes, clear. Yes, clear. Arjun. Oh, okay, perfect. Sound is sound clear, is but clear, clear, but, uh, but uh, there, but, uh, are, there uh, are some uh, lag. Okay. It seems like it seems like the presentation is full screen. Full screen. Um, for others, for they others, have they have this problem. Other? Or problem or not? How is it for you? Is it a problem for everyone? Yeah, there's a yeah, there's a black margin around screen. the screen. Yeah, let's live with that. You can still read the slides, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. All right. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so let's say now we want to design specs. So we want to understand what does our object detection algorithm actually needs to achieve. So let's assume our urban speed limit, uh, we're talking about America, is say 15 kilometers per hour, which is around 14 meters per second. Let's say the highway speed limit is 100 kmph, which is 24 meters per second. And let's say the comfortable uh, deceleration is usually less than 2.5 meters per second square. And let's say the maximum emergency de uh, deceleration, which is not comfortable for a human, but the maximum that a car can do, like, you know, hard brakes is 
five meters per second square. And uh, let's say the time taken to stop after. So then, how how much will this time? Uh, so uh, what will the time be to stop after hitting the brake? Uh, it will be say we are uh, and suppose we are on a highway at twenty eight meters per second. That will be from twenty eight meters per second, like maximum speed. We hit the brakes and then it will take us a minimum of five point six seconds before the car will come to a complete halt. Right, so and let's say there is a latency in the brake subsystem. Like after pushing the brake, the brake subsystem takes like three hundred milliseconds to actually respond. I mean, this is actually pretty realistic. So one third of a second, and let's say there is this another latency of three hundred milliseconds in our vision fusion tracking time. Like after the object detection happens, and when it gives to fusion. So we'll talk about what fusion is, and then we'll talk about what tracking time is. But basically. after your object has been detected like there is this another 300 millisecond latency in your system which is again very normal so then if we take these two things into account we will see that the distance it travels before it comes to a complete halt is 95.2 meters right so then what happens then given say so for a typical camera let's say we use a 2 megapixel camera uh, with a focal length of 2000 pixels uh the image of a pedestrian who is 1.75 meters tall and is this 95.2 meters away on the road is only 35 pixels tall right so then what am i saying that for a 2 megapixel image if we really want to identify people 190 uh, sorry 95.2 meters away i need to, and i have a camera like this one which is like a realistic camera we will need to be able to detect it uh as small as 35 pixels in that big image right so uh right so this is our requirement that okay for the first requirement is we need to be able to detect it within uh as soon as it is greater than equal to 35 pixels tall and i remember here we are still not taking care of you know small people and uh, children and so on for them we will need uh, it to be still smaller like half the size now so we've require uh, we've kind of come up with like okay how big the person should be when we detect it so this is one of the requirements for our object detection algorithm the second requirement is how fast should it be if you want to make it run in a um, in a car so let's say our uh, vision plus fusion plus tracking time is 300 milliseconds and let's say tracking needs three cycle of vision plus fusion for high certainty so this is something which you know people do so you kind of need to have validation from say three time cycles before you can be completely convinced that there is a person there uh and let's say fusion also needs confirmation from two different sensors so this is also what cars do like they would want to see the same person from two different sensors to make sure it's a person and uh, let's say that uh, of this 300 milliseconds we have 100 milliseconds for vision plus fusion uh, which implies like less than 50 milliseconds for vision and let's say we want to do it for eight cameras on the car right because we want to detect uh, objects everywhere on all these eight cameras uh, in one system right so we then have a processor which gets this feed from all these eight cameras and in less than 50 milliseconds right so 50 milliseconds is a very small time it's only 20 frames per second so in less than 50 milliseconds or at least at 20 fps we need to be doing this thing so we need to be able to run our algorithm hopefully uh, uh, like eight and eight such copies of this algorithm on different images on some piece of hardware you may have a very powerful uh, gpu in a car but even if it's like very powerful like four teraflops it is still very hard engineering if you want to do all those eight cameras on that one system okay so uh, so this was just like a basic specification of what is it that we would try and come up with in this lecture and then i will actually start to talk about uh, Computer vision in general, right? Uh, sorry, object detection in general. So uh, maybe this is a good point to like ask one or two quick questions. So any questions so far? So all we are saying is, yeah, we need the person. We need to be able to detect uh, as soon as it is thirty-five pixels tall and in less than fifty milliseconds. Yeah. What is yeah, the cycle? Cycle of 
vision vision so, cycle essentially means like the first frame we process then the second frame the third frame so if you're doing uh, 20 fps that every F, every frame is one cycle so three cycles of vision means that it needs to know that okay there is a person in three frames consecutively only then it will be super confident that okay it's a person and then i should start breaking because it can then you know so this uh, more say, got robust it, got estimation it, got it. yeah yeah thank yeah, you yeah, thank you okay then uh, moving on so what is detection well wikipedia says that you know detecting instances of semantic objects of a certain class such as humans, buildings, or cars in digital images and videos is what we want to learn. And practically, it is essentially just the task of associating a label and a bounding box to all objects in an image. So if we have objects in an image, such as in this shelves on the fridge, we want to uh, identify them. So we want to put a box around each object and also label them. So uh it can be either inside a refrigerator or on the street so on the street you want to put boxes around each vehicle and label it you know like either a car or a truck or around different traffic signs and so on and so forth so this is what is object detection Oops, sorry. so here we see uh, tesla's object detection specifically the uh moving vehicle detection so it does all of, a lot of other detections but here we see just the moving vehicles detected so you can see that you know the green ones are vehicles in its own lane so it first detects all objects and then it also has to decide okay is it in the ego way ego lane meaning is it in my own lane because then i need to take action based on that and if it is in the other lane if it is blue then maybe you know i don't have to do anything so there are there are newer videos of this one especially in the urban setting which is very cool you can look it up if you want so yeah so this is again uh, object detection for autonomous vehicles now uh, these are important data sets so if you want your want to get your hands dirty with object detection uh, maybe these are some data sets you can start with right so coco uh, data set uh, is uh, uh, where uh, so from microsoft they the lead on this data set and they this data set is a, has about 200000 images and 80 object categories then we have this pascal v2 which has 11530 images and 20 categories so this is a very good data set to start with this pascal vuc data set because it's manageable and you can maybe test your algorithm on this data set and then maybe try it on bigger data sets because you know then it's simpler to work with the smaller data set then the ImageNet data set also has a subset of its images labeled with boxes and categories so 200 of these thousand categories have been labeled in 500,000 images of those million images and google open images is like this giant data sets of more than 15 million images on 600 categories okay so you know what is classification well given an image you want to label which is cat now classification with localization now localization only in the single sense like you just have you always assume that there is only one object in the image you you then have also one box now general object detection is when you also have other objects in this image right so uh, you now want to put a box around every object in the image and then also put a label to that box so here you see that the red boxes are uh, Cats, the blue box is uh, the dog and the green box is uh, duck and so on. Uh, then there's another problem called instance segmentation. So I guess you'll have a lecture soon or you've had a lecture on semantic segment. So have you already had a lecture on semantic segmentation? Uh, yeah, so semantic, yeah, segment so semantic segmentation, has been, segmentation covered. has been covered. Okay. So yeah so maybe we will then look a little bit at instance segmentation so in semantic segmentation we label every pixel as you know uh, one label or the other but it does not distinguish between say different instances of the same object so here we don't want to label all only just the pixels of the uh, say the cats 
but we also need to know okay which cat is which one right so this is instant segmentation where you are able to do a semantic segmentation but at the instance level where you are also able to distinguish between the two instances okay. so now let's say we want to do classification and now by now you all know that okay classification is straightforward you would take an image maybe do an image uh, alex net kind of a network you know do some convolutions poolings finally maybe just uh, do some flattening then some put some fully connected layers on top and finally have these thousand neurons corresponding to the thousand classes right and uh, you would then maybe put a cross entropy after softmax layer you put a cross entropy loss and you're good to go you will have a classifier now let's suppose the task is to do localization where you have your image so you want a label for that image but you also want to output one box so now the assumption is okay we will only have one box right so then what would you do you would know that okay you want to output one class so you will still have those thousand neurons for say the thousand classes and then you will have maybe four more neurons and these four neurons correspond to the parameterization of your bounding box so you can parameterize your bounding box as you want you can parameterize it by saying you know the center point and the height and width or you can say the top left and bottom right so as long as you are consistent your network will learn the same so in this case yeah we learn the center point of the box x y and the height and width of the box so now what would you do so okay you will have these outputs and then what would you do you would maybe put a uh, cross entropy on the classification branch and say the l2 loss on the bottom branch so here what we did was we had you know these uh, 4096 so if you look at this blue this one cross one cross 4096 the last layer the last layer before the fully connected so uh, before the last fully connected so you will then have two uh, two fully connected on this you will have one fully connected going from 4096 to 1000 and you will have another fully connected going from 4096 to 4 right and then on the second branch you will put an l2 loss and on the first one you will put this cross entropy loss and then you will do some, you will combine the losses and then minimize this loss together now this is a multitask setting because now we have two loss functions and we need to balance it right we need to make sure that both of them are minimized and it's not one loss dominating the other so this is a general multitask problem i mean you can do it in different ways you can make sure that the magnitude of loss is similar you can also do some fancier methods to decide how you weigh the two losses but yeah the only thing to note is that yeah both the loss should go down it shouldn't be that okay this one is going down and the other one is not so both of you have to bring both of them to a similar magnitude throughout the training process now the question is how would you do it for multiple objects okay now for one object we know that we should have four output neurons okay because we have assigned these four output neurons to this one object now suppose i have 2 or 5 or 10 and i can have different numbers it's not that i will always have 2 or 5 or 10 so how do i now design a network where i have say multiple number of outputs so any ideas guys i mean just a quick thought how would you do that how would you be able to design a network such that it can have variable number of outputs any thoughts well um let's see how to do this right so we will do something uh, so yeah we want to put bounding boxes and so this is what we will actually like learn in this session like how to uh, how to make it work even when you have multiple objects okay so let's let's first get the not so interesting stuff out of the way right so we we should so whenever you build a machine learning algorithm the first thing you should build even before you build the model is the evaluation framework because you need to be evaluate you need to evaluate your model you need to know how good your model is only then you will be able to train your model because if you don't know how good your model is you don't know which model is better than the other right so this is why let's quickly go over the uh performance metrics for optic detection so we want to get to this mean average precision and for this i'll briefly explain iou and precision and recall so did you guys 
uh, I mean, probably you have already seen IOU and precision and recall, maybe in semantic segmentation and uh, also the pre quiz. But uh, have you already looked at mean average precision? We have covered, we have covered, I you, but, not, uh, but map. not uh, map. Okay, all right, good. So let's then quickly go over IOU precision recall and not. So, IOU, as you know, is simply the intersection over union, so the measure of box similarity, right? And we then have the area of overlap over the area of union, so the area of intersection of the red and the green box and the area of union. And as you know, the maximum score you can have for this metric is one. And this will be when they are exactly overlapping each other, right? So when the red box and the green box are exactly overlapping. And every, in any other case, it will be less than one, right? And uh, it can also be zero when there is no intersection. Uh, so then the intersection area is zero. So this is intersection over union, very simple. Now let's go over precision and recall. So precision and recall are also simple and they're matrices that you need to look at uh, both of them together. You cannot look at any one of them in isolation. Why? Let's say this circle is what we should have predicted, right? So five of the points right, the green part, and we got three of them wrong. And this green rectangle on the left this entire rectangle is what we predicted. So instead of predicting just the ones in the circle, we also predicted some extra ones, which we called false positive. Oh, sorry, um, my bad, my bad. So let's go over it again. So uh, what we should have predicted, right? What we should have truly actually predicted was this entire left, uh, left half of the square. So this left rectangle, this green rectangle, but of that, we could only predict the parts in the circle, the five points in the circle. So we missed out on the uh, on the elements outside the circle in the green part, in the left part. And on top of that, we predicted a few extra ones, the ones in the red circle, in the right side of the circle. And the ones which we did not detect in the right side of the rectangle, or in the right rectangle, in the right side of the square, are the true negatives, the ones which should have actually been negative. So how is precision and recall defined? So precision is what percentage of your uh, positive predictions are correct. So if you see at the bottom, precision is essentially the ones which we correctly predicted upon the ones which we totally predicted. So the half circle, the left half circle upon the total circle. But like I said, looking at just this precision number in isolation can be a problem. So uh when is a case where we will get say perfect precision but it is actually a very bad answer any ideas maybe it will be clear uh, clearer when we look at recall so recall is saying what percentage of ground truth objects were found right so in recall we are putting just the left part of the circle uh, we are dividing it by the left part of the square. So any ideas, when can we get a, like a very high recall value, but the answer is actually very bad. So what would happen, imagine if we predict everything, if if we say, okay, my positive, uh, my, my result is, you know, all the dots. So in that case, we will get a perfect recall value, right? Because we're predicting everything. Similarly, precision, if you just predict one and you predict that correctly or you don't predict any, then you get a perfect precision. So this is why precision and recall in isolation, you should always look at them together. So this was precision and recall. And if these two are clear, then let's look at math. So yeah, so why should we not be satisfied with 100% precision or recall? Because in isolation, they can be misleading. Okay. So then let's quickly talk about mean average precision for object detection. So what we do is first we sort predictions according to confidence. So assume you get got a bunch of boxes as output on the image and each box comes with a confidence value. Just let's say the output of the softmax 
right so what we will do is we will sort them based on their confidences then we will calculate the iou of every uh, of every predicted box with every ground truth box in this case it will be so i'll show you this thing. yeah let's see this yeah so in this case yeah in this case what we have is so in this setting there were actually six uh, ground truth objects right so the six objects totally but instead of predicting six we actually predicted 10 and we have you know our boxes 1 to 10 our 10 predictions and they are sorted by their confidence so we then sort them based on their confidence then in so this is the first step in the second step what we do we take the first box the box with the 0.91 confidence and we calculate its iou with every ground truth box okay we then uh, have a matrix so now in this case since we have six uh, 10 predictions and six ground truth boxes we create a 10 cross 6 matrix and we then start to populate this matrix so the first row then corresponds to the first box the box that we predicted with the highest confidence and then we say okay for we then populate the row corresponding to we then calculate the iou with every ground truth box and so for the, from the first box maybe it's 0.1 then 0.2 maybe with the third one we get a very high score say 0.9 then we get again a 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. We will have 10, uh, six such values, right? Uh, we do the same for the second one, for the third one, for the fourth one. We do the same for all the 10. We try and find the IOU of all the predicted boxes with all the ground truth boxes. And finally, what do we do? We match predictions to ground truth using IOU. Right, so correct predictions are those with IUU greater than a threshold. And typically we say, okay, if we have IUU greater than or equal to 0.5, then we are happy and without replacement. Meaning if we assign a box to a ground truth, we cannot assign any other box to that same ground truth. So essentially we go over the first row, we find the best IUU. So in our case, we had say a 0.9 uh, with the fourth object we then assign our this box to that fourth object and then we cross the entire row and column right so we cross the first row and the fourth column now we go to the second row now we need to assign this second object this second prediction to any of these original objects except for the fourth object because the fourth object is already taken by the first one right and whenever it's greater than 0.5 so we keep doing this and in this process we find we do this true false so what we're doing is we are converting our uh, object detection problem into a classification setting so that we can calculate uh, precision and recall and finally mean average precision so for the first one we said okay true because it was a true prediction because it had a high iu with one ground truth object in the second one again true then the third one, unfortunately, we could not find any match because uh, it did not have a high score with any of the boxes. Uh, or even if there was a high score, it was maybe already taken by the first and the second prediction. Right? So similarly, then the third one is uh, again found a good match, the fourth now, and so on. Okay? Um, in this case, the total number of ground truth boxes were six. Now, step number four five and six is where we do the entire thing so yeah so in step four we calculate precision and recall at every row so based on the definition from the previous slide precision is essentially a number of uh, uh, the total number correct found upon the uh, number found similarly recall uh, correct over total right so we have uh, in the first case we found one and it was correct so our precision is one and our recall is 0.17 because we found one but totally there were six so one by six is 0.17 and we then do this uh, for this entire table so this is step four and then in step five we so th then we can essentially kind of plot this kind of a curve right a precision versus recall curve so you see that recall will uh, continue to increase but precision can kind of vary a little bit so it can increase and decrease because initially it was 0.1 then it decreased and so on 
And here we say that we take the mean of maximum precision at 11 recall values. So we now want to essentially average our precision over some 11 recall values, predefined say 0, 0.1, 0.2, all the way to 1.0. And we this is called average precision. And we do this at a point which, uh, so this is a minor detail. And the detail is that we take the value of precision which is greater than or equal to the current one like from the next step so uh, don't worry about this but essentially yeah you have all these points on the curve and then you average it so you get average precision and then you mean it over all the classes remember until now we were doing it only for some class of object let's say cars then you also want to average the average precision of say the rider and the pedestrian and so on so this was uh, average precision and then we average it over all the classes to get mean average precision yeah so uh, like i said maybe this is one good point to maybe take a small break uh, and maybe ask a few questions and then we can continue oh can you hear me is there oh. an can you hear me is there an echo uh, not on my side i can hear you well hello Hi, Prasun. You uh, want to say something? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Uh, can you mean average person again? Uh, mean average person again? So, if I do that, we will not have time to cover other things, right? So, maybe we will have a video for this one, and you can maybe go over the video. And essentially, it is just calculating precision and recall so you need to start it's just an algorithm right so it's nothing it's just this algorithm where you sort your predictions you calculate the iou so you have this 10 cross 6 matrix you select uh, the correct matches and based on that yeah, you have how are you like, making the yeah, how are you just making this matrix just that, only that that part okay yeah so the matrix is simple right so in this case we have 10 predictions and six ground truth so you will create a 10 cross six. Okay, so you had 10 predicted boxes and actually there were six ground truth boxes. So you the size of your matrix should be 10 cross six. Then you will take the most confident box. So you'll take the first box, which is the most confident box and you will try and associate it with any of these ground truths. So you'll go over the first row. So remember in the first row, we have 10 elements because each row has 10 elements. So we will calculate the IOU with every ground truth box, right? And this is how you create the first row. Then you go come to the second row, which is the second most confident box. And then you calculate the IOU with every ground truth box. So this is how you create the matrix. Is okay. that clear? Okay. 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 Sir. okay. okay. Any other questions? So is it as so is it as straight? Forward as uh, low recall. Forward as uh, low, low recall and high precision from the graph. Sorry, I could not hear you. Uh, is it like uh, we? Uh, is it like uh, we choose low recall and high precision? No, we are averaging over all uh, recall values, right? So we are averaging over recall at point, uh, zero, one, two, three, four to get this average precision. So this is why it's called average precision. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So you see the okay. red dots? This is where we Thank take you. the precision values and average over it. Okay. Sir, basically in this case, okay. uh, sir, basically in this case, uh, the image, uh, in the end, uh, uh, in the end, uh, after part, get that, uh, precision recall, uh, we get that uh, precision recall, uh, because it's, it's not something which is in the loss, it's not something which is included in the loss, but like, yeah, 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 it's not a loss. So loss, we will do cross entropy and so on. We'll see later. This is for evaluating the model. So for model selection, like what is the performance of a model? So yeah, you don't use it as a loss function. Sir, could you explain how we got this? Average? Sir, could you explain how we got this average? Yeah, so I just explained uh, uh, a bunch of times right and unfortunately if i explain this whole thing again we will not have time to cover a lot of topics that we have planned so mm -hmm. cool thing so so after the mm -hmm. meeting cool thing so oh. so after the meeting oh. sorry your voice is breaking 
after the matrix how did we get the curve after sir? the matrix how did we get the curve sir yeah so we got the matrix and then based on the matrix we did the association based on the association for every row we got a precision and recall value and then we averaged over these recall values so we then took we want to then calculate average precision so you want to take the precision at recall 0 0.1 0.2 0.3 all the way to 1.0 got it sir got it and that's it got it sir got it okay all right then i guess we will move on so now let's talk about object detection so uh, we want to estimate the bounding box and their labels so what is the what is the object contained in that bounding box so let's talk about you know a bunch of approaches so let's talk about say probably a very naive approach which we call a brute force approach and the idea here is that we will run a classifier for every possible box so we have this 13 cross 8 grid and we then want to get say all boxes of size 1 and then all boxes of size 2 and size 3 so you know 2 cross 1 2 cross 2 3 cross 1 3 cross 2 all these various combinations and then all bound boxes which kind of classify as cat we can kind of say that okay this is a box which has a cat but obviously this does not work because you we have to then like run a classifier over so many boxes and remember we want a classifier we want essentially an object detector which works in say 50 milliseconds so i guess you are convinced that we cannot do this then another technique which people did earlier was this sliding window approach so in this sliding window approach what they do is they say that okay we have a classifier for say one sliding window so you see this sliding window there this yellow box so i will simply slide this box over my entire image and i for example here we are classifying a pedestrian so whenever it overlaps a pedestrian it will be able to classify it as a pedestrian and whenever it is say in the background it says it's not a pedestrian so we will slide uh, you know all this sliding window over the entire image so we'll slide it over the first row then we will come one pixel down then again slide it and we will keep doing it until we hit we hit the right bottom corner and so what we will we get if we do this we will get for every uh, for every position of our sliding window we will get if it's a person or not right so we will get two values like yes or no or just one value saying how much yes confidence of yes so you will kind of get like a response map out like a heat map which will then give us you know the bright areas the areas with high confidence will be areas where our object might be present so this is what people did back in the day so the hog and sm based classifiers were essentially sliding window models but the problem with sliding window is that you our sliding window if you see can only deal with one scale because we have uh, trained our you know classifier only at that one scale but how do you ensure that people are of the same size and if you want it to work uh, on people of different sizes then you also want to deal with this scale uh, problem and one way to deal with this scale problem is to create this scale space space pyramid which essentially just means that you want to uh, take your image and then down sample it multiple times and then run a classifier mm -hmm. at all Uh, levels and you train uh, so what will happen is you know when you run your classifier at an image which is of smaller size that in that uh, in that scale it will be able to detect people who were bigger so you train your classifier on for the smallest object and then you kind of make it run at different scales so you make it run on an image where the person looks smaller so that means it's actually bigger and then you have to keep doing that so again the problem is that it's still slow especially for our real time uh, ambition so it is still not feasible especially if the classifier is heavy because we have to run the classifier so many times over so all the windows okay and in this case we are still not able to deal with different aspect ratios so let's see what can we do next so the the idea i mean the question people asked was you know how to reduce the number of boxes currently in this case like we are doing a sliding window over the entire image so there are too many boxes it's actually i mean if there is if we're doing it as a stride one then we almost have the same number of boxes as the number of 
pixels in the image minus the window size, right? So that's a lot of boxes. So in that case, people ask this question, how can we decrease the number of boxes? So one idea was let's find some blobby image regions which are likely to contain objects and then run a classifier for region proposals or boxes likely to contain objects. What it means is we will try and find, you know, some candidate boxes somehow, and then uh, we will try and uh, classify those boxes. And later we also had, you know, class agnostic object detector, which is like region proposal network. So, but we will come to that later. So initially, uh, these region proposals were something called as selective search. So this paper from 2013, selective search, all it was trying to do was to find some blobby regions in the image. And it was essentially doing a greedy combination of this sub, -sub segmentation uh, to produce larger candidate object location. So it would like do aggressive segmentation. So it would find all, so you look at this first image here and then it will try to greedily combine and it will do it for certain iterations and then we will have some blobs. So you see, we will have blobs of uh, small size in the first image and then of bigger size in the second one and much bigger in the third one. So with this, what we are doing is we're reducing the number of tentative boxes that we need to check. So now we have much fewer boxes right? Because we are only finding these blobby regions. And we also have uh, boxes of different sizes because we are also doing it at different scales because we are combining the segments. So we also have boxes of different sizes. And then you just take each of these boxes and check if there is your object in that, if there's a pedestrian in that, if you're doing a pedestrian classifier. So this was one idea where you could come up with these proposals which could reduce your search time, which could reduce your runtime. So this is again, something which people were doing. And you see here, we uh, they are using this mean average precision, which we just looked at. And this is in the pre-deep learning error, like just before deep learning came out. So from say DPM, mm -hmm. this deformable parts model was a very popular one in 2007. And all these approaches, you know, all the way till 2011 and 12 were like DPM plus plus and so on. So based on DPM, but they could get to say this 41% uh, mean average precision and at, uh, at IOU say 0.5. And even here they were kind of stagnating. And then came this uh, RCN in V1 and V2 in 2013 and 14, which got to 53 and 62%. And in 2018, 19, we were at like 81.3% and probably we're still a little bit higher. And this is on the Pascal BOC data set. Okay. So we will start with 2013. We will not look at uh, how people were doing object detection back in the day. We will look at what people started to do after uh, the advent of neural networks of CNNs. So the first one, you know, this uh, RCNN. So this was like uh, by uh, Ross Gershik in 2013. And this is like the simplest object detection algorithm that you can come up with. So even if you sit down and think about an object detection algorithm, if you want to write one from the scratch, maybe this is what you will come up with. So here the idea is very simple. You take your input image, you run this selective search, which we saw earlier. Remember the selective search is has nothing to do with learning. It is just a deterministic algorithm run on, uh, on the image. So you just do the segmentation and then com combination of segments. So, uh, right, so you would just do that on this image, on this input image. Based on that, you would extract region proposals and they said, okay, we will take uh, 2000 regions and then they would crop that part of the image. So for every region, they would, you, they would crop that part from the image and then they would scale it to some standard size. Let's say 64 by 64 in this case, right? So they will not care about the aspect ratio. They will just squish and stretch it. And then they will put it into a pre-trained network, let's say an, a pre-trained network on AlexNet, uh, on ImageNet, say AlexNet, they'll put it into AlexNet. And then they will get uh, features. So the representation 
so the activations of the second last layer just before the classification layer and they would take this and then use an svm to classify so then they will train an svm on these features so the entire idea here was that yeah, instead of using these handcrafted features like a histogram of gradients or you would use these uh, cnn features so there is no real object detection algorithm here you're, you're still using the same old methods of earlier but you're just using deep learning or or cnn for the representation for transforming your image into a, a low dimensional vector okay so exactly the same as selective search except uh, for cnn features instead of hog okay any questions on the rcnn uh, why did uh, why didn't they use the softmax layer, layer in the end and why did they use like svm classifier uh, yeah, they used the SVM classifier because they were still doing much better than all others. And this was the start. This was 2013, so seven years ago. And they didn't use the softmax because they want an embedding. So softmax already kind of, uh, you know, pushes the ones which is not confident down and uh, pulls the one which is, you know, a little bit more. So it kind of does, a, uh, it kind of does this nonlinear scaling on the activations. And this is not what we want. We want to get an embedding. We want to get a representation. So when you want to get a representation, you always take the one before the classification layer. So the output of the second last layer. Okay, so this was like pretty straightforward. So now, uh, so, uh, so yeah. yes. Uh, there Hello, is a, there doubt. is one doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 in the in the uh, in the sliding window part. Each part. Each part. In the sliding window, window, part, window part, contains some processing. Some right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Correct. Uh, for, a uh, for a pedestrian. Correct. So, so what if, what there, if are multiple there are multiple objects? objects? So each so sliding window has some processing for, yeah, for uh, uh, each object. Correct, correct. And your sliding window may be of different sizes. So you will first run your sliding window for the pedestrian of a different size. Then you may run your sliding window for the vehicle class, which may be of a different size. So it's really slow. That's the whole point. Sorry, you're asking me to use headphones. Yeah, I'm using headphones. Okay, 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 okay. Because when anybody else has a question, okay, 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 okay. because when anybody else has a question, there's a lot of it for all of us. Okay. So maybe, for all of us. maybe you know, just type your questions and then I will read the question out yeah, and yeah, then yeah, they'll sure, be no echo. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, similar pixel regions are considered as a block. Yeah, correct, correct. So good. So, all right. So yeah, any more questions? I mean, maybe you can type. If not, I can then go back to the slides. Okay, so I'll go back to the slides for now. So okay, we did RCNN, which was like straightforward. The simplest form of object detection. Then in the next year, they came up with our fast RCNN. So fast RCNN was again, pretty straightforward. The only difference here was that instead of cropping at the image level, they were cropping at the feature map level, right? So because you can at least reuse some computations already performed at the image level. So the input to the network now is the entire image instead of a blob. And then you still run selective search on the image. You get the various boxes and then you map these boxes to your uh, feature map. So, I mean, you know that, okay, there is a down sampling and shifting and so on. So you will still be able to map your uh, proposal onto this feature map and then you crop this feature map right so instead of cropping the image you crop this feature map now they have this one problem that now this feature map can be of different sizes right after you have cropped it can be of a different size and now if you want to pass this uh, uh, different sizes of the feature map how do you do that do you do 
like do you scale it to the same size like you do to an image or can you do something better now the problem with feature map is we don't really know what it is right like what kind of a representation is it and if you try to do say uh, bilinear interpolation or such it may not really make sense because maybe uh, bilinear interpolation at a feature map level does not mean anything so they came up with something very interesting very something very straightforward which is called the roi pooling layer and the property of an roi pooling layer is that you give it variable sized input but you get same sized output right so you can give it different sizes of input and the way you uh, and based on your configuration you can you'll always get the same sized output so uh, what you are doing here is you are taking your image putting it into a cnn getting features for the entire image then running your uh, proposal your selective search on the image getting your boxes mapping it onto your feature map and then looping over each of these boxes looping over each of these uh, you can say 2000 let's assume they're doing a 2000 so then you loop over each of these 2000 boxes you uh, take the feature map for the first box you put it into the roi uh, pooling layer the roi pooling layer will give us a fixed sized output we'll see how it will give it'll give us a fixed sized output for the first box we will then pass it into the second part of our network which is simple uh, fully connected which gives us you know uh, as the first one the confidence of the box like okay which class it belongs to and second is just four numbers corresponding to the uh, uh, to the you know center or top left bottom right for the bounding box then you do the same for the second box you take the second crop from the feature map you put it into the roi layer you get some uh, fixed size vector you put it into some fully connected and then you uh, get two outputs for it one the class for this box and second the bounding box coordinates for this one so there is a loop here in the second part and how you do this how do you do this roi pooling layer well let's say uh this is your feature map right so let's say we have this eight cross eight feature map and let's say one region of interest uh is this and we want an output size of two cross two so this is what our roi layer does like no matter what is the input size it will give us an output of size two cross two so let's say this is the region proposal this is what we got from selective search we mapped it onto our feature map and we then want to convert this into a two cross two representation now how you do it is like really straightforward like the simplest way you can think of so you would first divide it into a two cross two window now how would you divide say five into uh, two and two well you would just do say integer division so five by two is two so you'll just take the first two and the remaining three then becomes for the second one and similarly in the column side again what is seven by two it's three in integer sense and then you get the first one three and the second one four and then you simply take the maximum values in each of these uh, windows so 0 0.85 0 0.84 0 0.96 and 0.97 and you get the output now this operation clearly is differentiable it's simply finding the max and during backdrop what happens is whatever gradients come to the output of this layer they then get propagated only through these uh through these neurons where we select from so this is like max pooling in some sense right so so this is how you do roi pooling again very straightforward and yeah so you find 2000 proposals and loop over each of these proposals and you get the output okay now uh, something now remember we're still looking at this 50 milliseconds right so we uh, training time is not that interesting i mean maybe we have a lot of training time but still you see for rcnn took like 84 hours to train and they can train this fast rcnn in um, in just 8.75 uh, hours but you look at this test time and this is very interesting so the blue bar is the total run time and the red bar is the time it takes without this region proposal step the selective search step remember this is still you know uh, uh algorithm like a deterministic algorithm running maybe on the cpu so this takes also some time and rcnn okay so it seems like it takes about you know uh, two seconds 
for this selective search. So, yeah, maybe for RCNN it's not a problem because for one image it takes 49 seconds with RC uh, with the selective search with the region proposal and 47 seconds without the selective search. So this is fine. It doesn't make much of a difference. We haven't talked about SVP net, but look at fast RCNN. So the whole image takes 2.3 seconds which is a big improvement It runs really fast. I mean, for those times, but the network just takes 0.32 seconds because now we're doing it at the feature map level. So, you know, our um, processing is much faster. So 0.32 seconds is, yeah, a very nice number, but uh, it takes about two seconds for the selective search because now if you do both the selective search and the network together, it takes 2.3 seconds. So it was clearly evident that we need to get rid of the selective search because I mean, this is now our bottom, right? So in the next methods, so majority of the time is still taken by region proposal, the selective search, and the next methods basically try to fix this problem. And this is what modern object detection will look like. Maybe I'll take like one or two quick, Questions by chat uh, before moving forward. Yeah, so one question is, uh, what if the pedestrian is too close to the camera, the sliding window won't detect, right? Yes, uh, it will not detect, right? Because if it's covering the entire camera, then it's too big, it wouldn't detect. I mean, even for modern systems, it will not work. So this is not just a problem of, of sliding window uh, detector. Any other questions, guys? No? No, no. Oh, okay, all right. Then no, I'll... no. Cool. So you see, I mean, yeah, a fast RCNN came up with something interesting. They were able to re reduce the time taken by the network a lot, but since they were relying on this selective search algorithm for region proposal generation, they're still bottlenecked by that. So let's see what people did in the future. So this is uh, faster RCNN. So there was RCNN, fast RCNN, and now faster RCNN. Faster RCNN is one of the modern networks. and uh, the main idea was to also use a CNN for region proposals. So instead of using selective search with just segmentation and combination, we then train a region proposal network. So here we also have a trained network to also propose the regions. Okay. So how it works is you have, say, your, you put your image into a continent, right? You get some features. So you get these feature maps. And on this feature map, you train a region proposal network. And this region proposal network essentially gives us say, and let's say we have trained it to give us say 2,400 boxes. So region proposal network has a fixed size output. And on top of that, every proposal also comes with an objectness score, meaning is there an object or not, right? So the confidence if there is an object. You can also think of a region proposal network as a class agnostic object detector. So here, it'll just give us uh, boxes, right? And each box would just come up, come, would also come with a objectness score, meaning how confident it thinks if there's a box here, or should there be a box here or not. And while training also it's straightforward, you would just remove the labels of all boxes and uh, simply train this class agnostic uh, region proposal network, right? So all the time it'll output 2,400 boxes, but uh, most of them maybe will not have, you know, a high objectness score. So we will threshold it. We will say, okay, we will only run our second part of the network. Uh, so the RY pooling and so on, on these boxes where the objectness score is high, maybe greater than 0 0.5, 0 0.7, whatever. This is a hyperparameter. And the core network you see is shared between the region proposal network and also the classifier head. So the classifier head remains the same as fast RCNN, but the only difference is that here the region proposals are coming from this region proposal network instead of our uh, selective search algorithm. Okay, and what does this region proposal network looks like? So this region proposal network looks like this. So, I mean, uh, okay. So what we do is, let's say we have, say, you know, uh, the feature map is of size, you know, like 17 cross 17, okay? So, 
17 cross 17, mm -hmm. we have essentially down sampled our input image a lot, right? So we have the 17 cross 17. And now at each location of this 17 cross 17, we run, um, so we have, we say, we have a convolution layer with say a filter size of three cross three, right? And each, and we are then, and then we have some outputs corresponding to, so each convolution will then give us this one number, right? So uh, in this case, let's say we have a uh, filter size. So let's say our output feature maps are of size 17 cross 17. And for simplicity, let's just say there is one channel. There, there is usually multiple channels, but here let's say we just have one channel or uh, right. So we have one channel of size 17 cross 17. And then what we want to do is we want to run a three cross three filter on that. And we then want, uh, a bunch of output neurons for this, right? So we want maybe 2,400 output neurons for this. And, um, just one second, sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear. And uh, then what we want is, so we then say, okay, at every position of my uh, kernel of my convolution, you output say K anchor boxes. So here we have this concept of anchor boxes, meaning, okay, at every position, there can be maybe, you know, some five kinds of boxes of different safe shapes and sizes. So in practice, we have uh, three scales. So you can say you have say three scales with areas, you know, 1200, 2500 and five, uh, five, 5,000 pixels and three aspect ratios. So you also have three aspect ratios of uh, one is to one, one is to two and two is to one. So three scales and each scale will have three aspect ratios. So totally we will have nine. So K will be nine for us here. And for each anchor box, we want to also, so these are, okay, a classification. So we'll do a classification onto these boxes and we will also have a regression for this. Like we will also fine tune this box. Maybe this may not exactly overlap our object. So we will also give it some scope for moving around, like to fix it a little bit. So we will also output four numbers, dx, dy, which is the offset from the center and dh, dy, the offset of height and width. And like I also said, we'll predict two objectness scores, okay? Now, um, I'll explain this again because I know I was not very clear. So essentially what we're trying to do is we are running a convolutional kernel now over the heat map, multiple convolutional kernels over the heat map. And at every position of the kernel, we are then trying to predict say these nine numbers. So if we'll have nine numbers for the first position of the box, nine numbers for the second position, nine numbers for the third position and so on, right? So uh, so then what are we saying? We're saying for all these uh, 14 cross 14. So on this 14 cross 14, we will uh, then run this three cross three filter and each of this, uh, and this will give us, each filter will give us nine output numbers and so nine output boxes and each box will also come with four additional numbers right so you'll have nine boxes so it'll be like a classification okay which box is it and then each box will also come with a regression meaning okay how much should i move a box to make it really perfect okay so maybe i'll stop here for a bit and then uh, look at your questions in the chat window and then we can proceed further. So essentially what I'm saying is, okay, there's a region proposal network and the region proposal network then gives us boxes and this is how the region proposal network works. The scale of boxes is high, yes, correct. The scale is a hyperparameter. So they did some, uh, hyperparameter tuning, some validation on the validation set and set these hyperparameters, the scale of the boxes, the number of boxes, all of that. So hope Pete method that answers your question. Okay. 
any other questions okay ritik says for prediction we use categorical loss function or cross entropy for regression we use msc yes always i mean almost always so correct so for the categorical loss for deciding okay which of those nine boxes is it we use a cross entropy loss and then to find the offsets we use a regression we use a msc loss or 9 3 cross 3 the kernel size no 9 has nothing to do with the 3 cross 3 kernel size so all i am saying is this 3 cross 3 kernel size will output so each position of that 3 cross 3 will already output these nine confidences over each of those boxes and four additional numbers for each of those boxes right any other questions no should we proceed yeah yeah okay all right cool so so you see here i mean this is kind of a, a representation that says okay you have your input image you uh you know you basically the top part is your region proposal network so you put it in a cnn you have your anchor boxes that is what you uh, then used to train your region proposal uh, sorry then you have your uh, regions which is coming from your rpn and then you loop over all those regions and put it into your roi pooling so uh, note i mean so one thing to note is that see we are still looping over all the rois right so we have all these rois and we are still looping over it and faster rcnn usually runs at this uh, say 5 fps i mean the normal one the one in the original paper you can see it in the abstract of that paper but this 20 200 milliseconds is good but remember our goal was 50 milliseconds so we still need a 4x improvement and then people ask this question so can this be further simplified you know the part where they are looping over these region proposals so these are two stage methods so i'll show this later essentially these are two stage methods meaning you have the first stage where you generate the uh, uh, region proposals right the region of interest and then you loop over all these rois in your second network which is a very small network but still there is a loop here so the question we want to ask is can this be further simplified so uh, the answer was yes and the answer was you know so beyond faster rcnn people came up with these one shot network these one shot output meaning uh, you don't have this loop anymore essentially you get the output for all regions in one go and how do you do this you i mean uh, it's a very if you think about it it's a very simple solution and the solution is instead of just getting the objectness score why don't you get even the class score because our region proposal is already giving us boxes over you know all the objects but if only we knew the category for that object because it's class agnostic when we do an rpm but if it also knew about the class then we are done right and this is what people have done in yolo and ssd so there are some differences in yolo and ssd uh, both have versions which use anchor boxes and not anchor boxes yolo v4 is a good one uh, ssd started to use you know um, uh, features from multiple uh, scales so features from feature maps of different sizes yolo had different ways of dealing with uh, objects of different sizes and so on but uh, in this Uh, lecture we will look at in detail how yolo works and it's also very simple but before we go forward now let's look at the mean precision scores on pascal voc 2007 data set for our modern uh, algorithm so you know dpm was at uh, 0.5 fps and its uh, mean average precision was 34.3 then came rcnn rcnn was really slow right so there is no fps written for that uh 
and x axis is time y axis is our mean average precision score so higher is better then came fast rcnn fast rcnn was again 0.5 fps and uh, mean average precision was high for 70 faster rcnn was you know mean average precision of 73.2 but fps still only 7 but then came yolo and ssd so yolo and this is yolo v1 yolo v4 is much better but yolo v1 came about and the fps was 45 which is really good even for autonomous driving uh, and the map was also not so bad it was 63.4 and ssd was you know similar map as compared to faster rcnn so instead of 73 these guys have 72 but the fps was really high like 58 fps so this came about in December, and there are more modern algorithms. So SNP, Sniper, I mean, uh, the list goes on. So if you want to uh, use, uh, then there's Retina Net with uh, focal loss and so on. But if you want to use an object detection algorithm, if you want a tiny one, you can start with YOLO v4. Faster RCNN is a good baseline. I mean, it's strong, it's slow, but it's strong. And then if you, then want to do more advanced things, you should look at these leaderboards. So maybe the Coco leaderboard or the Pascal VOC leaderboard and see which methods are winning on those data sets. And then maybe look around those methods. Okay, so before I start YOLO, maybe a quick stop again for any questions. And if you have a question, you can already type here in the chat window, right? So that when I then come back here, we will already have the question. Yeah, good question. So somebody says, is Retina Net form of SSD? So yeah, it is exactly SSD. But the problem in these one-shot networks is, I mean, this is a detail, but since probably you know a little bit about it, is to then be able to balance it and like negative mining because you see uh, like so, uh, so many negatives and so few positives, you want to balance it properly. So, and this is not trivial in a one-shot approach in a uh, two stage method you can easily do this so when you train ssd with something called as focal loss uh, you get like really good results and then they call it retina net so hope ashish that answers your question okay how is higher accuracy achieved in one shot instead of the learning yeah so higher accuracy is achieved by uh, training it better by making sure you do things right and yeah essentially the so one big one uh, one big leap for uh, these one shot methods was to use this focal loss so hope sort of that answers your question i mean it's not that two stage uh, methods cannot give us uh, one stage method cannot give us high accuracy it's that just that it's not easy to train them due to some reasons which i will talk about later but yeah, with some uh, near algorithms, we can do that. Any other questions at this point?
Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry, something in the Okay, and you can, can you also see my screen? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so, All right. Now, can you still hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes. Check. Okay. All right. Great. Right. So now talk about YOLO, right? So what we want to do is we want to predict all bounding boxes of all objects in one shot. So given this image, we want to output a box over the dog, over say that vehicle, over this bike, say three boxes. So what we first do, we split the image into a grid. Actually, we don't do it at the image level, we do it at the feature map level. But for simplicity, let's just assume we split this image into a grid, right? In this case, the seven cross seven grid. Now, uh, what we do, we each cell predicts the op uh, confidence. So again, this objectness, like is that cell an object or not? And also, each cell, in our case, I mean, our, we have chosen two anchor boxes. So it's not really an anchor box, but two boxes. So in this case, at each grid also predicts two boxes. You can also have more boxes, right? So uh, centered at that grid point, it predicts two boxes and also confidence of the box. So in this case, you see, we have uh, one box and the other box. The other box has a higher confidence. Confidence is shown here by the thickness of the line. Uh, if you look at this block, so the objectness here is low and also which means that the confidence of the two boxes that you have here are also low. So we've drawn it as thin. Now you see we have like uh, thick boxes for the three main objects and thin boxes elsewhere. So we split the image into a grid and each cell predicts boxes and their confidences. So it, each cell predicts two boxes and their confidences. So if you have the seven cross seven grid, meaning 49 grid locations, meaning we will have 49 into two boxes as output, right? So 98 boxes and each of them will also come with a confidence score. How confident are we that there's a box here? Now, remember, this is still an RPN in some sense because we still don't know about the class. So though we know there is a high confidence box, we don't know the class. Now, how do we do a class? We also let each cell predict, a, uh, so each cell predict these boxes and their confidences, and we also let each cell predict a class probability, right? So each cell also predicts a class probability. So each cell predicts um, a car saying, okay, this is a bicycle. So all the pink ones are bicycles and the orange ones are cars and green ones are dog. And though we had no dining table, the bottom uh, blue ones are, it's predicting as a dining table. And then what do we do? Uh, so this is conditioned on the object. So then what we do, we simply multiply this with the box confidence of that grid, right? So we then, uh, these, box and the class predictions are combined. And to combine them, we simply do a multiplication. So each cell also predicts a class probability and then the box probability and the class probability are combined. And finally, even after combination, you see we have like too many boxes. So we do something called as non-maximal suppression. I'll show what non-maximal suppression is. And then you get the final boxes. So in YOLO, what does it look like? Each cell, so we are, remember we have seven cross seven cells, means 49 uh, uh, grid point. Each of those grid points predict what it predicts for each bounding box, four coordinates. So we have two bounding boxes for each grid point, right? So we have eight of these coordinates and one confidence value. So like five into two. So each grid point will have 10 outputs. So you see, let's look at, you know, so we have this seven cross seven face of this cuboid. Let's look at the bottom right corner of this seven cross seven face and let's go through the entire depth of this. So I'm looking at the grid 
uh, I'm looking at the output corresponding to the grid cell at the bottom right corner, right? So you see, since there were two objects, so the blue object and the green object, it first predicts, okay, what is the probability of it being an object, firstly? So the confidence of that box, and then the location of the box, uh, X, Y, height and width. Similarly, for the second box, like how thin or thick the box is, right? So thin or thick is given by this P object, and then we have X, Y, height and width. And then we also have uh, a class conditional object, like if it was an object, so it's conditional on the object, like if it is an object, then it should be a car. If it is an object, then it should be a bird. And then uh, uh, when you multiply these probabilities, it becomes like uh, a P of cat given object into P of object, which then is, uh, you know, a P of object. So for the seven cross seven grid image, we have seven cross seven grid and each grid essentially has two boxes. Each box has five elements. So, you know, it's seven cross seven into uh, two into five plus 20 because we have 20 classes because it's Pascal VOC. So then totally uh, this volume has one, four, seven, zero outputs. So our neural network, our YOLO network essentially predicts one, four, seven, zero output elements. Okay, um, and let me quickly talk about NMS and then we will talk about maybe ask some questions. So let's say our YOLO was predicting all these uh, yellow boxes. Now we also associate labels with those yellow boxes by simply multiplying it with the probability of each cell. And then we do NMS. So in NMS, what we do is we suppress boxes. So of all those white boxes and blue boxes and uh, orange boxes, we want only the relevant ones because there's so much overlap. So what do we do? For, we do it class-wise. So for the first class, let's say this vehicle class with white boxes, we take the most confident box, okay? We take the most confident box. And then what do we do? We do a IOU with other objects, with other objects of the same class, with other boxes. And whenever the IOU is high, say greater than 0.5, we remove that box because that is usually something which has already been covered in my current box, right? So you do that for every object, for every class, and you kind of then have NMS. So the algorithm looks like this. I mean, it looks maybe a little bit formal, but it's very straightforward. So the input to this algorithm is this set B, B1 to Bn, which are the N boxes. And each box also comes with its confidence, S1 to Sn. And NT is our normalize uh, our uh, NMS threshold, right? So what we do is D and D is the output. So D is an empty set to start with. And while our B set is not empty, we first and uh, B is for, so we do it class wise and we're currently doing it for a single class. Let's say we're doing it for the vehicle class. So maybe then we only have three boxes and the output should be one box, right? So we take the most confidence box and call it small m. And we also get its confidence and call it this capital M. And we then add this uh, box to our output set, right? Because this was the most confident one. And we also remove it from our original set B. And then what do we do? We find the IOU between this box and every other box and say, okay, if the IOU is greater than this N, this N subscript T, then we also remove it from our set B. And similarly, we also remove its corresponding score. Let's not worry about soft NMS. People interested can look up soft NMS, but this is basic NMS, right? So maybe I'll again stop here for a few minutes and answer any questions before going forward. Any questions, guys? No questions? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yeah, I don't think yeah, I don't think there are any questions. Okay. In NMS we compare it with boxes. Of, yes, in NMS you compare it with boxes of the same class, RAM. Okay. Any other questions? All right, then I think we anyways just have a few other slides to finish, right? So 
then SSB is essentially like Yolo, but it predicts using multi-scale pyramidal feature hierarchy. So this is what it does. And like Yolo, but it predicts using multi-scale pyramid features. So then this is the advantage because then it you know, has uh, representations of objects of all sizes. And one very important thing to note is that there is this anchor box, right? You need, you have these anchor boxes. And whenever you want to train your, uh, say SSD or YOLO or any detector for that matter on your data set, this is the most important hyperparameter that you should fix, like the anchor boxes. So one way to do it is to, you know, so this is a plot of uh, on the x-axis we have height, of y-axis we have height, x-axis we have width of all the ground truth boxes. And we see it's all over the place. And then we want to find anchor boxes, which is our red boxes here, to kind of cover this entire space so that our anchor boxes make sense and we are able to do uh, good outputs. So this is this two stage versus one stage, which I was talking about. So single stage is this one shot and two stages is where you have a loop. And one very detailed and um, in-depth paper from Google Research is this one here, the speed accuracy trade-off, if you actually want to um, like do this for production, right? So yeah, I guess this is where uh, we will call it a day. But the next thing that you should look at yourself is, you know, how can you do object detection and use it for semantic segmentation and call it like instant segmentation? Uh, what is focal loss? Uh, when you do, then there's this mark, a mass carcinogen which can do instant segmentation. So you should look at something called as ROI align and so on. And I'll just conclude. So I have these things prepared, but I'll just uh, skip over them. Uh, and right because we're kind of running out of time so yeah this is focal loss and yeah so since we started with autonomous driving i'll just tell you like okay what you should do so you should have like a common feature extractor or core network for your multitask problems like you will not just do object detection you will also do some classification so on and so forth so have a common feature extractor so it should be like a fast network which should take less than 20 milliseconds, though we have 50 milliseconds, the core network should run in less than 20 milliseconds for a two megapixel image. So the only options are kind of, you know, mobile net uh, or shuffle net, or even the old Google net, the inception v1. And then we would want to use a feature pyramid network or a retina net architecture. So we want to obviously do only a single stage architecture because we cannot uh, do this looping business. So we use a single stage head for different tasks. And we then fork from this core network at different points for different tasks. Uh, you need to make sure that it's able to handle high variation in scale and aspect ratio. And we, like I said, we need to figure these anchor boxes and anchor boxes will be different for traffic lights, pedestrians, cars. So we should be careful in finding these anchor boxes. And then we need to tune our anchor boxes and our network strides using clustering. And then you may also have a semantic segmentation uh, head for stuff. So boxes are things then everything else is stuff. And you may want this ROI uh, uh, region of interest based heads for zooming in and understanding on the details of objects. And finally, you need an efficient hardware implementation, meaning you need to convert your model into eight bits and make sure, you know, you, so if you have a, NVIDIA hardware, you may want to use a tensor RT and convert your model into eight bits, make sure there is no loss in performance, do the calibration or uh, convert it into whatever is your target hardware. So intake conversion and calibration. And finally, you then need to give this output over to fusion and tracking and finally uh, the vehicle control, right? Uh, and you would almost always only do uh, C++ runnables because yeah, I mean, you really need to have control over the entire thing. You would usually be using like a ROS based system, so a robot operating system, because there are uh, multiple cameras. You need to synchronize between them. You need to know that which frame from which camera corresponds to which other frame from which other camera, because you may want to take joint decisions and so on, right? So this is all you may need to do if you want to build a system for autonomous drive. And this is all I had for today. And at this point, I will come back to the screen. So
So yeah, Harvick says is Tesla using SSD? We don't know. They don't tell this, right? So I'm pretty sure they're using some version of a single shot detector, but exactly what? We don't know. Ashish says in practice. How are these methods supposed to be used? Writing from scratch or by using the offering by authors? So it depends on the licensing. I mean, to start with, you should definitely use the offering by the authors. Tune it on your data set. Make sure your anchor boxes sizes are correct. The strides and so on are correct. Maybe change the core network, the feature extractor, so that it suits your task, either online or offline. And then maybe make improvements onto the method. And if the authors haven't released it in a license of your liking, then you may want to re-implement it. Does that answer your question, Ashish? No? Welcome. Any other question, guys? Okay, Ritik Jaiswal says, what about detecting a new image which is not present in the data set like Coco? We manually create a ROI and bounding box over the image with help of tool. So should we use in that case, I mean, what architecture should we prefer? I have used YOLO. There's a lot of problem with detection and lags, image computation. I have to use real time. Right, so like I said, yeah, I mean, real time again depends on what hardware I'm talking about a GPU or a Pascal or a uh, Raspberry Pi or what. So, yeah, I mean, try use YOLO v4, maybe reduce still layers from this. And if you want to do retraining, so you can start with their pre trained network and then on your new data set, you can do some pre training. But yeah, the most important hyperparameter is to adjust the size of their boxes right so this is probably something you need to do for your images like you need to make sure you tune yolo for your images and uh, the most important part is to measure the precision and recall and the map values so you need to understand just visually is not good enough right because um, you need to have like an average over so many images so you need to measure the mean average precision for your data set and then make changes see if it helped or hurt or it hurts, and then continue to do this until you get an uh, get an improvement in your network. Okay. Any other questions? Hey, uh, sorry, maybe it's best to type the question. No, it's just Otherwise, it's... thanks, Arjun. I think I don't. No, it's just saying oh. thanks, Arjun. I think. Uh, I think. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Right, and this will be uploaded and so on, so you can again.